Uh, our first uh, presentation for the day is um, Tor Ostervold from uh, Eco Sub C. You might have seen his stuff next door. And uh, the title of his presentation and his solution is The Ecological Way of Underwater Hull Cleaning. So please help me welcome Tor from Eco Sub C. Have fun. Thank you. Dear delegates, sponsors, governors and executive team of the Ocean Exchange. My name is Thur Östavold, and I'm the CEO and founder of EcoSubsea. First, I want to thank the jury for nominating us. It is a great honor to be part of this fantastic Ocean Exchange in Savannah 2013. I'm going to show you a presentation now, and I'm going to talk to you about the environmental way of underwater hull cleaning. Quite exactly three years ago, I was sitting in a meeting room in the 32nd floor in Singapore when suddenly the door opened and the technical director of the shipping company, National Oriented Line, came in. And he had this with him. And he came over to the table and he did like this. And he said, Tour, this is our problem. Can you help us solve this? And if we get the presentation up now, you see a ship that consists of a lot of fouling. And fouling or biofouling is the buildup or accumulation of slime, larvae, algae, organisms, and animals that attaches to the wetted surface of a ship quite soon after the ship has been put into water. And this accumulates as commercial vessels are trading over the oceans. The problem with biofouling is that it increases, it, the ship needs to use more power in order to get the same amount of speed. It is just like for us, if we were swimming with our clothes on, with extra resistance, we would use more power in each stroke to get the same speed compared to if we were swimming in a speedo. And what happens when a ship uses more power to achieve the same amount of speed, the engines are working harder. And for engine to work harder, it needs to use more fuel. And for each extra ton of fuel that the vessel is using to get the, its wanted propulsion, there are three tons of CO2 coming out its funnel. And it, research shows that only biofouling and can you imagine this? Only biofouling constitutes an extra cost for ship owners globally of about $8 billion a year. And to the environment, that constitutes to about 70 million tons extra of CO2 that is released out to our fine environment. But it's not just plants. It's not just algae that are transported with vessels. It is also organisms which often are called alien invasive species. And you saw this fantastic movie, <laughs> which has shown it in a way I've never seen before. <laughs> but it's actually a real threat. And Nordstrand and Vorge said in 1999 that biological invasion is one of the most serious threat, ecological threats for the early 21st century. And the problem with this is that there might be a species, for example, here in Shanghai, that sticks to the bottom of a vessel. Then it hitchhikes with this vessel all the way to the port of Savannah, where it releases and, in worst cases, can make large harm to the local port environment. And, in worst cases, take over the whole local environment. And this has happened to such a big extent that the IMO have actually put up a map, which you can see on the slide here, which shows the main trading routes for in alien invasive species. Their research shows that there is approximately 600,000 organisms sitting on any commercial ship at any time. If you multiply that with the 2,373 port calls which were in Savannah in 2012, it is quite interesting to see that about 1.4 billion organisms were actually visiting 
Savannah last year. That's interesting, isn't it? Further, what does make fouling so relevant these days? Well, before 2008, we had this tin-based uh, material called TBT. And that is, to say it in simple terms, it's poison that is put in, in, as an ingredient in the anti-fouling paint. So it, while our commercial vessel were trading, it continuously leached out from the paint, and thereby less of this were growing on the hull of a ship. But in 2008, IMO banned the TBT. And since then, we've tried to conquer nature with nature in a way. And that has pretty much made the problem with biofouling grow to a much bigger extent than earlier. So what have been done with this? Well, the traditional way of dealing with it has been divers cleaning the ship's submerged surface with rotary brushes or brush-mounted equipment, as you can see on the slide here. All to the left, you see the vessel coming down. Under, you see the diver holding a rotary brush equipment. When I was in Singapore, uh, the M I had a meeting with the MPA, the Port Authorities, and they reported that over the last four months, four divers had died during hull cleaning because they had lost grip of the ship and were taken through with currents. So it's a big safety concern with this this method of doing it. Secondly, the brush technologies, they don't only take off the biofouling on the ship side, but it also removes paint. Protect the paint that should actually protect the vessel from biofouling. And last uh, but not the least, all of this is, have just been released out to the local waters. So there has been a major pollution everywhere where it's been allowed. Because when you are cleaning one place, this was are coming from Shanghai, the one coming with Norwegians from Oslo, and so on, will have a concentrated disposal of waste in these particular areas. That have caused, or that have, have had a, a following, and that is that most ports globally today have prohibited in-water cleaning. So now we have a tricky situation. Of course, after 2008, the ship owner has had an increased problem with fouling. Because, and which have resulted in more fuel to be burned, more CO2 to be emitted. When, when they had the challenge of fouling, they were cleaning their vessels using diver with brushes. When this has been prohibited in most ports around the world, you have a situation where you can't, where the ship owners or operator are losing a lot of money on biofouling, making a lot of emissions, but they can't actually manage to get the service who could help them with it. Can we afford a situation that continues like that? Thank you. I don't think so. <laughs> In EcoSubsea, we have switched the diver with a mini submarine, as you can see on the picture. We have developed some groundbreaking technology which can clean the vessel without even make micro scratches to the paint. And there's one more thing. It collects over 97% of everything that is cleaned off the surface. Isn't that great? <laughs> now we're going to see a video of how it works. As you can see, it's, the whole equipment is built in, in simple containers. So it's just to put it on the quayside, 
start operating not while the vessel are at anchorage or in operation, but while it do cargo operation. So it doesn't even lose valuable operational time as it would be if it had to do it at anchors. The technology has been pat patented with 38 patent families worldwide. And as of now, we know about two competitive solutions. They have, they have almost half the collection which EcoSubsea have today, but we hope actually that they also will succeed in getting better systems because we think this is a too big problem for one company to solve alone. We started in 2008. This drawing was made on, uh, on the last of March, 2008. And the 1st of April, 2008, we had a meeting with AP Möller in Copenhagen. This is the prototype which came in 2009. And 2012, in the, in, the, in the end of the year, we put up the pilot station in Gothenburg, which we are still now operating all over Scandinavia. In 2013, we received the big honor of receiving the Young Entrepreneur uh, Award uh, amid, in the midst, midst of uh, one of the most important places for shipping to meet at Nor Shipping in Oslo. And now further, our goal is to build two full-scale stations around the English Channel before we go for further expansion to the US and Asia. I believe that technology is crucial but I believe that a strong team is even more. And we have a fantastic team in EcoSubsy. Uh, number two from the left is Klaus Ostavol. He is the guy who has been operating the equipment and actually managed to make it work. The guy in the middle, Janel Korsjan, he has been sitting at numerous of board internationally and in Norway. And he has, amongst others, been sitting two years, 10 years as CEO in the technological giant Kongsberg Group. To the right of him is Karl Inga Osland, a fine guy and the best I know, in, uh, the best technician I know in electrical ROEs. He's right now selling his Porsche because he wants to buy stocks in the eco subsidy. Ain't that fantastic? So what are we doing today? Well, recently we've cleaned four vessels with our pilot station. The pilot station were only meant for doing tests, but the ship owners who used it pushed us out and said, well, you can do the test. Why don't you keep on and clean the whole vessel? And so we did, and it works all fine. What we are doing, what we did yesterday was to clean the transpulp on the lower side of the sli slide to the left. And right now, as we speak, we are working on Slingerbog, and I can't wait to hear the to hear a report in five or six hours time. The next vessels that we will clean is Williamson's MV Texas and the oil company Statoil's Star Bag. And uh, what is greatest about this slide is that those customers who have purchased the initial cleaning have now purchased the second or third. And I couldn't be more happy about that. So what are the significant savings with EcoSubsy? Number one, reduced emissions to air. If we manage to clean 300 large container ships in one year, that constitutes to CO2 savings of 2 million, 2 million tons of CO2. And if you compare that to other industries, that, is the, that, is, that constitutes to half the CO2, annual CO2 emissions from a coal-fired power plant. Further, it would minimize the impact of invasive species because vessels trading or going over the ocean with less of this will have less species attached. And those that we are cleaning off, we're taking up and collecting them in filters. It would be a safe hull cleaning alternative. And what about the ship owners? It was earlier mentioned that the importance of savings, not only environmental, but also economical incentives. For a large container ships, we did research for this is the company AP Muller Mursk, and it showed that on an average vessel, it could save over $1 million a year on having the vessel cleaned once to twice a year. We have looked at the return on investment, which says that for each dollar you as a ship operator or ship owner put into in-water cleaning, you receive 15 back in reduced fuel cost. And that's magnificent. Further, we have now opened new ports where it's previously been forbidden in Scandinavia. 
And we hope that we can continue opening ports because we are now coming with a solution that will enhance port marine environment as well. And last but not the least, a method that, <coughs> I'm sorry, a method that would l make the lasting of the anti-falling paint longer, which also saves a lot of money and hassle. What do we see with Ocean Exchange? I see opportunity. We now have a service which we give to the ship owner that cleans the vessel, so the vessel uses less CO2. Further, we collect the debris and we take it out for filtration. What I hope that we can invest in further is to look at opportunities where we can utilize this biofouling and this waste into a, either biogas production or to biofuel. And then you would have a full green circle with, and a viable business case behind it. Further, we see, we see opportunity in ports. We now have access around Scandinavia. We are now working towards the English Channel. But our next aim is the entry in the US. And therefore, our aim, we are aiming at an establishment in Baltimore. And the Ocean Exchange is an opportunity for that. Now back to the technical director in Singapore. What did I answer him? Well, I said, sir, our vision is to build a network of cleaning stations around the world in the most busiest ports. And then we could clean your container ship long before the fouling reached this extent. And that would save you a lot of bunker and it will save the environment for a lot of CO2 and invasive species. Thank you very much. Very well done. Good job. Good job. Well, I have to say the bar has been set pretty high. Great job for the first one out. That's always hard to be the, the first guy on stage for a thing like this. So that's our 15-minute presentation. Now it's your turn. Uh, questions, uh, and obviously he'll be around uh, throughout the next two days, but uh, you have an opportunity now to take a few minutes uh, and ask some questions, if there are any. I had a question. Okay. If you can, just please step up so we can record it for the video as well. Hi, Tor. Um, nice presentation. My name's Andy Thank Hooten. You. I'm one of the board of directors of the Ocean Exchange. Um, two questions for you. Can you talk, one, a little bit about the technology specifically that's involved in the cleaning action? And then number two, what do you do with the reject material in terms of waste management once you've collected it all? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, the technology in specific uh, is a new developed uh, high pressure principle. That's the cleaning part of it. It actually uses high pressurized seawater uh, to break down the barnacles without damaging the paint. The second part of it is a vacuum system uh, which sucks up all these residues that are re uh, released during the cleaning operation and uh, then this in combination enables this cleaning device, which is approximately of this size, to be connected into the, into the ship side because the water jets are making a curtain and the suction are then making under suction to the system. So it's actually forces helping each other so it, uh, to, to, in order to maintain an efficient operation and to stick to the hull makes, them, makes the maneuvering simpler as well. Then you have a mini submarine with, with pumps which are actually holding propellers. So this is driving the, the, the cleaning device back and forth on the ship side and up and down as well. And then you have the opportunity to clean on the inside from the key side or from a service vessel. And you operate the mini submarine in a safe place and you have 120 meter cables which are connected to the, to the cleaning device. I hope that wasn't too complicated. Um, your second question was, what do we do with the waste today? Well, we have delivered it as garden, garden waste, mostly. Uh, and that is, of course, that, that's okay. But I think that if there would be an opportunity to actually use it, this is, so to say, only organic material. So it obviously have a value for the environment further. The job isn't all done. So what we hope is that we can use it in, as I mentioned, green gas production, 
or as uh, to make biofuel. Very good. Please step up if you have another question. Could you compare yourself more directly to some of your competitors who, for example, have ownership rather than um, service models for business for their business model, and also who plan to do the cleaning and deep ocean so there wouldn't be any chance of contamination of the of the ports? Yes, I can. I can compare us. Well, I, I haven't compared us to 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 divers because that is mostly prohibited. They are obviously those who've been doing the most. But the ROEs, yeah, but the remotely operated uh, companies that we know of are two. Uh, Possess, they are sitting in Gothenburg and in Dubai. And the reason why we established in Gothenburg was because we said that we have so much belief in our system that we have to test it towards those who are working on some of the same technology. So the biggest difference there is the collection degree, whereas they have uh, between 40 and 50 percent of all the debris that is collected is released into the port. No, then the, the remaining 50% are released into the port, uh, while we collect 97%. The second part is the high pressure principle. That's quite technical, but it's been a tradition that if you use too high pressurized water, you come to a place where you're cutting, uh, like water cutting. Uh, so we've used uh, many years actually on developing a, a a technology which doesn't even mic mic micro scratches to the paint, and the paint contractor Jotun says at least today that we are the only one who have managed to clean, tested all their paint types without damaging it. If, if I could just refine a little bit more, the, the, the difference between ownership, the business model side, you talk specifically about technical, the ownership model by selling your device to a, to a ship operator, I asked you about this yesterday as well, by a service model where you're actually ah. providing the service. Is there pros and cons to actually selling your devices, vice ah. servicing? Because it sounds like you're describing more of a service model for your yes. solution. Yes. The reason why we are choosing a service model is because that's, that's the way we can insert in quality in the end. Uh, we obviously are evaluating different sorts of business model and we'll do as we, as we progress. Because obviously have, we have a large market to cover. But for now, in the first five or six uh, stations that we are building up, we need to ensure quality, reliability, and simpleness of the equipment. Mm. So therefore, we have chosen to provide the service as well. Uh, we will make sure that that day when we are selling a product, we are certain that that will be of great quality when it reaches the vessel, the ship owner, and the ship operator. So, but uh, it's, I think it's really interesting to, to evaluate, eva evaluate these two. I think that the selling or, or hiring or franchising, that is a, is a point that we, is a couple of years in, ahead of us. Uh, and so far, because of the quality, we are staying uh, with the operation and selling the service directly. Very good. I think she was first, if you don't mind, sir. Ladies first. Thank you. How long does it take to clean a container ship is my first question. Mm -hmm. And second is your price structure. Mm -hmm. How much does it cost for mm -hmm. I will answer the first question and partly the second. Um, <laughs> How did I know that was going to happen? <laughs> uh, the, the, as for now, we intended, as I told you, the pilot station would only be for testing. But what has happened is that we now operate on some of these vessels as efficient as we were aiming at doing with the full-scale station. Uh, that means that, for example, we cleaned the Pearl Seaways in Copenhagen two weeks ago in one port stay. And that's obviously the solution. We are aiming at cleaning a vessel in one port stay. Uh, in some cases, for example, the color uh, fantasy, that only stays in ports for two hours and it's 226 meter long. That forced us to use <laughs> several times. So it depends a lot on time in port uh, versus length of ship or size of wetted surface area. But our mission is very clear. We need to clean that vessel in one port step. And over to the second question, I will uh, just remind about the return on investment. I think that our solution will be a little bit more expensive than divers because we are taking the industry to quite a, technolo quite a technological leap from divers just having a belt around their, their stomachs and having 
rotary brushes to a mini submarines uh, holding gears that is with large high pressurized machines uh, with fil filters and so on. Uh, but uh, when you look at it compared to the bunker cost, it is quite interesting to see that for each dollar that you put in in water cleaning, you get 15 back. So you know, what we are experienced is in a way that the cost of the cleaning haven't been the most crucial, but the current situation today is so serious for the ship operator and owners who are actually just seeing all these extra fuel being burned out of the funnels because of these invasive species. So when we come and solve it, it is a return on investment on 1 to 15, and you hardly find that in, uh, within business. So that's uh, very satisfying. Sir? My question is going to be more focused on the barnacles rather than the cleaning side. Mm. In Seychelles, we have fishermen who use a basket trap, and often they lose the basket trap, and some years later, you pick a basket trap, and it's full of these barnacles, right? Yeah. How much research has been done to eliminate the formation of barnacles? Are these barnacles formation influenced by the temperature of water or other elements? Has there been any attempt to try and destroy the barnacles before they create all these problems? He needs the barnacles. Really, really good, uh, really <laughs> good question. Uh, really good question you have there. Uh, obviously, before, before 2008, they had TBT, so that was poison that killed the barnacles quite efficiently. So we're leaching out of the paint. And what we've seen the last years is that there have been a lot of research on barnacles, but we won't, we don't really get it, right? It is a bit challenging species to get to to understand the full picture of. Uh, but what we know is that sunlight, salinity of the water, and temperature has a lot to do with the speed that fouling grows. Uh, another aspect of fouling is that it is transported as we speak, right out here and around the world, but we know so little actually about it. So what we hope with the eco subsea is that when we have a station, let's say we have a station here in Savannah, you would get all these debris from all these different vessels up to a filter at the quayside. And if we then manage to connect to good research environments, they would be able to come down and take as much tests as they can barely manage and test these and actually start mapping the, the extent of biofouling coming into our ports, the threat of the, the fouling coming into our ports, and make risk assessments and have a control on this strange species which we really don't understand fully yet. We have time for one more question. Sorry, Jim. Um, hi, thank you, Tor. I'm with the Georgia Ports Authority. I'm very interested in the water quality that yeah. um, could result from the use of your device. Um, a couple of issues. Um, do you use hydraulic power? Uh, you mentioned a 120 meter cable. Is that with a hydraulic oil? Yeah? No. No, okay. No. We, uh, our company's name is EcoSubsea. Uh, we, we hold the environmental focus as core for our business. So we've chosen not to use hydraulics, but everything that you saw in the movie and that we are seeing is electricity and salt water, okay. which are already there. Okay, very good. And then um, carrying on with the question about comparing to the devices that work in the open water rather than in the harbor, mm. um, if the other devices are scratching the paint, then would they not be releasing some of the antifouling heavy metals or whatever chemicals into the environment if they are not capturing 100% of the removed material, as you're saying, that you do that? Yes, and, and that's the main, one of the main reasons why the port authorities have prohibited in water cleaning. Because in most ports, you need to dredge every now and then. And with the, with the technology that they had before, with divers, with scratching of paint, you had all these heavy materials like copper and previously TBT and tin and zinc released into the water columns. And that was settled on the seabed from the port. So they had problems. And the port actually had 
huge extra cost when they were trying to dredge afterwards because the local port environment was so soon. So that's, for, that's a really important part where we hope that we can make a big difference for the port environment. Thank you. Yeah, dredging can be an expensive, long process, as we know here in Spain. So. One more round of applause for Tor. Yes, Thank you. Thank you very, much. very good job.